Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of salvation, one that has been planned before the heavens and earth were created. And we thank you for your steadfast love, your, your love shown to us in Christ Jesus. Fill us, we pray, with that love, with that grace, with that mercy, setting our sights on him, on our Savior, Jesus. Amen. So last week, we spoke about this, that proclaiming the name of Jesus and having faith in his name will create opposition. We saw last week, it was a bit of a courtroom drama, if you will. Peter and John were arrested while they were preaching in the, uh, por Solomon's portico. And they, were the, they greatly annoyed the rulers, right? Because they were proclaiming the resurrection. They were proclaiming Jesus and his name. So they are arrested. They're brought before the court the next day. And though they are pronounced not guilty, they are told to be silent. Now, it was a close call. They could have been uh, flogged. They could have been jailed or worse. In fact, although they didn't know it, more pers persecution was about to come and would happen pretty shortly with the uh, martyrdom of Stephen. Then King Herod would put James to death and the apostles would also face persecution and death in a variety of ways. According to, to tradition, Matthew suffered martyrdom, martyrdom by being slain with a sword at a distant city of Ethiopia. Mark was killed after being cruelly dragged through the streets. Peter was crucified in Rome, and the tradition has it that he was crucified upside down. Bartholomew was flayed alive. Andrew was crucified on an ex shaped cross in Greece. There's more, right? But you get the picture of persecution that was to come. But Jesus had forewarned them, hadn't he? From our gospel reading in Matthew, brother will deliver brother over to death and the father his child and children will rise up against their parents and have them put to death and you will be hated by all for my name's sake but the one who endures to the end will be saved. So, if you were Peter, if you were John, and perhaps the words of Jesus were in your mind then, what he had told them already, what would you pray for? I know if I were there, I'd be praying for safety, right? That I wouldn't face that particular persecution because who would want any of those things that I just mentioned that the apostles would ultimately face? None of us would want that. And yet they didn't pray for safety, did they? They had a faith in light of, in light of the resurrection, in light of the reality of Jesus they had a faith that prayed for boldness to proclaim the gospel. That's what they prayed for. They prayed for boldness even in the face of persecution. So we too can learn from the apostles. We, can, we too can learn what it means to pray, to have that assurance, and thus that boldness. So... Our outline, if you will, for today is we pray to our sovereign Lord whose plan was predestined to take place. Therefore, we pray for boldness, and I would add, we pray for boldness to proclaim the gospel. So let us begin. We pray to our sovereign Lord. It says this, when they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. So, when it says that they went to their friends, friends is, uh, it's an okay translation, but literally it went to their own. They went to their own. So, we would believe that they went to 
the body of believers. Probably more like the inner circle, right? The, the 120 that were praying together at Pentecost. So they would have been there with them and they would have shared everything that they went through. And what's interesting is what you don't find here. You don't find an account of how enraged all the believers were that those people, those rulers, were really doing that to Peter and John who had been with Jesus from the beginning. They didn't do that. They didn't get onto social media and say, cancel the Sadducees. Right? They didn't start putting up posters about cancellation or revenge or anything. There's no sense of revenge at all, is there? I mean, in our day and age, we live in a revenge culture. We do. And it's not because it's just the culture, but because that's the nature of our heart apart from Christ. The nature of our heart apart from Christ is one of revenge, of vengeance. But who does vengeance belong to? The Lord. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. So they didn't do any of that. Rather, this is what they did. They prayed. Listen. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and earth and the sea and everything that is in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and his anointed. I'd like you to notice this one phrase here. Sovereign Lord. They prayed and they began with Sovereign Lord. And actually, in the original language, it's one word. It's not two. But the sense of this word has master or ruler over all. Master or ruler over all. So sovereign is actually a good description here. Sovereign Lord, sovereign God. And why did they begin there? Because God does rule over everything. Right? There's nothing that is outside of his control. So there are a couple prayers in the Old Testament that attest to this. I mean, you can find this throughout, right? But Isaiah chapter 37. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, and you have made heaven and earth. Jeremiah chapter 10. It is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom, and by his understanding stretched out the heavens. We actually confess this in our creed, don't we? And I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in the Nicene Creed, we add, of, of all that is seen and unseen. Sovereign God above everything. So they start there. That's their foundation for their faith. He is above all things. And then they quote Psalm 2. And they quote it, not because they simply like it, but because this is God's word, right? It is God's word given to David through the Holy Spirit. And it says, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. Why did the Gentiles plot in vain? And by the way, Gentiles, it could also be translated as foreign nations or nations. Why did the nations plot in vain? It's a good question, right? Because if you take a look at the world today, don't you see a lot of plotting going on? Right? Nations, wars, all of this movement, shifting, you know. We, we just see that so much. And if you go to our nation, I think we're in election year, right? You see a lot of plotting, don't you? So there's a lot of plotting everywhere. 
But this plotting and rage isn't actually about political or national interests. Specifically, this rage, this plotting is against the Lord and his anointed. Or you could say it is the rage and plotting against Jesus. That's the rage, that's the plotting that's taking place. So the question is, why? Why is there so much rage plotting against Jesus? Why? And the answer is actually very simple. There's a hatred of Jesus and the fear of losing power. That's really what it is. A true hatred of Jesus. Why would anybody hate Jesus, right? Why would anybody hate Jesus? Well, they would hate them, hate Jesus because they love their sin more. That they are unwilling to submit to any higher authority than themselves. To admit that they're actually a sinner. So they hate Jesus at their core. And it's also about losing power. So if you are a ruler, and you are trying to have the people do what you say, but now they say, I follow Jesus. He is Lord and Savior in my life. You don't have as much power over the people. You can't control them as well. I mean, you take a look at what, the, what happened in the early church with Rome. They wouldn't profess that Jesus, uh, sorry, that Caesar was Lord. Jesus was Lord. And so they were killed. You see, there's a hatred of Jesus and a fear of losing that power. And it is very present in our day and age. Open Doors USA, a website that tracks Christian persecution. I want to show you a map of the world of Christian persecution. Right now, more than 365 million Christians suffer persecution and discrimination. So I don't know if it shows very well on the screen, but you have high levels, very high levels, and extreme. You can look at the map and you can see it's very high or extreme. These are nations that plot and rage against Christians. So when we pray for our brothers and sisters around the world, we really are praying for them. And now I know it shows the United States and, other, and Europe and other places uh, as low or non-existent, but it's creeping in, isn't it? More and more and more, if you do not comply you will face punishment. You will lose your job. You can be jailed. Bank accounts, banks will say they won't do business with you anymore. You can't even, uh, in some places now, do foster care. To actually taking care of kids, they will take that away. So, there is a hatred of Jesus a fear of losing power. Does this disturb God? I mean, is he bothered or worried about it? Maybe that's the way I should say it. Is God worried about this? This plotting and hatred? He's not. I can tell you, he's not worried about it at all. As a matter of fact, from Psalm 2, he who sits in the heavens laugh, laughs, the Lord holds them in derision. Now, when it says God's laugh, that is a, a figure of speech. It's not like God sitting on his throne mocking everybody else. It's a way for us to understand the distinction between mankind and God and how high and above everything he is. And there is nothing that mankind can do that will thwart God from his purpose. No matter how powerful or how weak you are, how intelligent or not, how spiteful or, or kind you are, nothing that you do is going to thwart 
His plans. Because His plans have been in place before the heavens and the earth. So, we pray to our sovereign gods whose planned plan was predestined to take place. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel's, Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. So it says that Herod and Pilate were put into place by God. That he put them there, and it was the plan for them to do exactly what they did. It was predestined. So the question is, what is his plan? Right? What is God's plan? Well, it's very simple. It is the plan of salvation. God's plan of salvation And it's from the very beginning in the Bible to the very end of the Bible. God knew that sin would enter into the world. So God actually announced his plan of salvation in the garden. He chose his people. He made a covenant with them. And that covenant was then fulfilled in the new covenant of Jesus Christ. And then all the way to the very end of Revelation, in which there is a new heaven and a new earth. And God will dwell intimately. You will see God face to face with him. It's the whole arc of his plan of salvation. And it is a beauty to behold. I've shown this before, but it's been a long time. So, somebody did a graphic model of the 63,779 cross-references from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Isn't that a sight to behold? And what was amazing in our study in Revelation, we actually, at the very last chapter, we did the part of the ark from the Old Testament all the way to the New, from Genesis all the way. One of those arcs was this is that in the garden, there's the tree of life, right? But sin entered in, and so God banished Adam and Eve lest they, uh, they partake, so to speak, of the tree of life, eat from the tree of life, and that they would live forever in their sin. So they're banished from the tree, but Jesus took the curse upon himself upon a tree. And then, at the very end in Revelation, everybody has access to the tree of life. Do you get the ark? It's this wonderful ark. Everything tied together, this plan of salvation. So did the apostles know all of this? Could they comprehend all of this? No. Can we comprehend all of this? Eh, No. We can get some understanding. But what they did know is this. The believers knew that persecution was according to his plan. That God will allow trials and persecution to befall his people. Now that might make you a little uncomfortable. Doesn't God just want to protect everybody all the time? Will he let persecution and trials come over even the faithful? And the answer is yes. So you have to ask, well, why? What, what is the purpose of persecution or trials? Well, there's a couple. One, persecution can be a form of judgment or discipline. Now, that's not the case, by the way. That's not the case with the apostles, the early church. There was no persecution because of judgment or discipline. But go ahead and read the Old Testament. There are a number of times that God has allowed that. Read Isaiah, read Jeremiah, and if you want, read Revelation. You'll see what God has allowed. But that's not the case here. But there is something about persecution for individuals and a body, the body of believers. Persecution can bring spiritual maturity. 
or fortitude and steadfastness, if you will. And going through times of trial and even persecution actually can strengthen the individual, can strengthen the body. James writes this, Count it all joys, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. How many of us that would say, I'm going through persecution, oh joy! Right? You just wouldn't, would you? But there is a blessing that can come out of that. And it strengthens the individual. It can strengthen the body. And persecution can be for spreading the gospel. I mean, take a look at what happens in Acts. Ultimately, the gospel, the church is being persecuted, and so they are spread throughout the area. There is dispersion, if you will. And because of this dispersion, the gospel is being proclaimed. It talks about being scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. And they went about preaching the word. Actually, you want to know something? If you take a look at the church, the times of the most growth of a church comes under persecution. The time of greatest growth often comes in persecution. There have been reports from Iran that it is one of the fastest, has one of the fastest growing underground church movements in the world. And if you read about China, you can see that Christianity, though they are destroying church buildings, though they are jailing people, the underground church in China is growing. So God allows that persecution for the spread of the gospel. And this is key here. The church doesn't grow. The body of believers specifically doesn't grow simply because people are dispersed. So we don't want that. It's not just about dispersion. It is about this. The church, the body of believers grows because the gospel is spread. In fact, if you take a look at the book of Acts, what you're going to find is the gospel is preached first, and then there are believers in growth, and then there's persecution spreading it out. Growth comes from the gospel, and the gospel alone. And by the way, it's not that we pray to be persecuted. So don't get that idea at all. Nor should we actually have behaviors that would invite persecution. But it's simply to understand that God will allow that as part of his plan. Now this is pretty sobering, isn't it? If you really think about it and take it in, it's sobering. God will allow you, allow us to be persecuted. So what should we pray for? Should we pray for safety, right? Pray for our well-being? The apostles didn't pray for any of that. What did they pray for? They prayed for boldness, right? They prayed for boldness. And therefore, we too should pray for boldness in proclaiming the gospel. And now, Lord, look upon their threats threat and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. I mean, what a prayer, right? To pray for that boldness in proclaiming the gospel. Now, I know very few people who actually pro, uh, who pray for boldness in sharing the gospel. I, I know more who pray for opportunities, but not necessarily boldness. <laughs> I, I, I've told this before, but there's a story about a, a guy who was praying for opportunities, and he got on a bus, 
and a guy sat next to him. And the guy said, oh, Lord, I need help. I need help. And this very timid man who had prayed for an opportunity was like, and the guy was like, Jesus, I need you now. And he said, Lord, is this a sign? Right? We pray for opportunities, but there has to be that boldness that goes along with it. So where does this boldness actually come from, right? We talk about boldness. Boldness is bravery or courage. But it really comes from having trust, confidence, assurance in our sovereign Lord. That's really where it comes from. Now, some people might say, well, it just comes from ignorance, blind faith. Well, you know what? Sometimes bravery, courage does come from ignorance. You know, sometimes it does. Let me give you a silly example. When I was 16, I had a Ford Pinto wagon. Cool car, right? Just exactly what a young teenage guy wants, a Ford Pinto <laughs> stick shift, all that, but yet it didn't run very well. And the carburetor had problems. Now, this was before YouTube. This was before all of that. So I got a manual, and I decided I would rebuild the carburetor. Had I ever done that before? No. So I rebuilt it, I think twice. <laughs> um, and it ran better. It ran better. But you could definitely say that was boldness out of ignorance, uh, for a car nowadays, I would never even touch that. I would say, you, here it is. You know, fix it, please. <laughs> but our faith isn't about that. Our faith is never about just ignorant trust at all. It is always about a trust, a confidence about the reality of who Jesus is is that he is the Christ, that he is the Messiah, that he came, suffered, died, and rose again. He has ascended into heaven and will come again to judge the living and the dead. And we have eyewitness accounts which attest to all of this. In fact, it's our creed, right? Just go over our creeds once again. You see, why did the early church have such bravery, boldness, fearlessness we talked about last week? Because they knew for certain who Jesus is. It wasn't simply a confession. It wasn't simply an intellectual thing that the people repeated. Jesus was and is reality. Right? There's a song, Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. So they didn't pray for revenge. They didn't play, pray, pray to get back. They didn't pray for their own safety. They prayed for boldness. And then they prayed this. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. You have to understand that miracles and wonders are, and signs are to confirm the preaching of the word. It is about the preaching of the gospel and thus it confirms the word. Those miracles, signs, and wonders confirm what has been being preached. So often today it's the opposite of that. That there's just supposed miracle signs and wonders without the gospel at all. Here, they're praying for God to continue those signs and wonders so that Jesus Christ is proclaimed, that his gospel is heard, that people might believe. And God did answer. And when they prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the Word of God with boldness. I mean, that's a sign, right? It is similar to what happened in Pentecost, but the, literally there was a, an earthquake. 
And if you take a look through Scripture, certain times there are earthquakes, which we call a theophany, but it is, it is a, a revealing, a presence of God. Sometimes in judgment, here in affirmation. And so they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And I want to emphasize this point here. They didn't spread the gospel just on their own power. They had prayed for the Holy Spirit to be with them, to fill them, to guide them, to give them the right words to say. And so this is why we pray to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God, three persons. It is so important that we do that. So this is the account. This is the account of the disciples. So how do we apply this to ourselves? Well, know that proclaiming Jesus and his name will create opposition. Got to get used to it. It's going to happen. So you pray to our sovereign God who ordains everything, whose plan was predestined to take place. And you, as followers of Jesus Christ, are part of that plan. That's pretty amazing to think, isn't it? You are part of that plan. And so, so therefore, so therefore, pray for boldness in proclaiming the name of Jesus and his gospel. You can be that guy in the bus, right? Pray for opportunities, but pray for that boldness to speak and trust that God is at work. Amen? Amen. Amen. 